thanking you, Father, for the opportunity to be in your house, Lord, and to take a look at your word and just praying, Father, that you would speak to our hearts tonight. Father, we pray that you would be with the, the children in the back, that you would speak to them, and that, Lord, you would just magnify your name uh, and that they would have a heart for you, Lord, that they wouldn't just be here because they have to but because they want to and that they would grow in the things of God. I pray, Father, uh, for uh, the football player Hamlin, dear God, a, a local uh, Pennsylvania boy from Pittsburgh. and uh, Father, he's clinging on to life, and I just pray, Lord, that somehow you would spare him, you would just reach down and touch him and, uh, and just uh, heal him of this condition with both his heart and his lungs, dear God. Father, I pray that eyes would begin to open, that uh, this is the result of the jab. This is what happens. We've seen this all through Europe. We've seen it in the younger levels in America, and now it's starting to enter the professional ranks. And I just pray, God, with uh, 95% of the NFL jab, that nobody else suffers the fate that this young lad had suffered. And Lord, I pray that we would begin to wake up to what everything that our government is doing to us and against us. And I pray, Father, we would just stand strong and true and, uh, and vote accordingly when the times come. Please, Lord, help us uh, to be a voice for you, not only for right and wrong and justice, but also for, and more so important than anything else, for the salvation of lost souls, that people would be saved and come to know your Lord and Savior. Truly, my greatest concern with this football player is whether or not he knows you, uh, whether he departs now or in the future. If he doesn't know you, it's not going to be good. And so, Father, give us that heart that would share the gospel with others, that would be burdened for lost souls, and that would open our mouth boldly that souls would be brought to Jesus Christ. So, Father, we thank you again for who you are and, and what you're going to do, Lord. In Jesus' most precious and holy name I pray, amen. All right, so uh, on a more positive note, of course, Penn State won their bowl game, amen. And so, of course, tonight I had to wear my khaki pants with my Penn State shirt because all the, all the coaches on the Penn State sideline, this is how they dress, amen. So you say, you're taking it too far. Well, I got to have something to celebrate, <laughs> amen. Oh, and the, you know, the Giants made the playoffs. How about that Steelers comeback? Hey, Amen. That was really good at the end. That's twice now I've seen him pull that out. Huh? Yeah, two weeks in a row. And I think the Steelers found themselves a quarterback in that young lad. I'll tell you what. And uh, well, I might, if I keep on talking about football, we might have to change the name to Football Baptist Church. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but we won't do that. Amen. All right, so now uh, Christmas and all that's over, so now we go back to our normal uh, study. So we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm glad to be back in a regular book study, and that's what we're going to be looking at here this evening. Now, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is broken up into two parts. You have verses 1 through 12 that deal with the believer's walk, and verses uh, 13 through, I believe it's 18, that deal with the blessed hope, the believer's hope. Now, uh, uh, the title that I have is The Life That Pleases God. And what we have to remember when it comes to our Christian life is that the Christian life begins with a step of faith. When you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, at that moment, you took a step of faith. Amen? But you weren't to just stop when you took that step of faith. Uh, you would uh, you would take steps that lead to a walk of faith, amen. A walk of faith, and uh, and the walk suggests what progress. So you progress in your Christian life. You keep on growing in your Christian life, and the walk also demands strength. And God has promised, as thy days, so shall thy strength be. Deuteronomy thirty three twenty five, a promise He made to Israel, but it's true for us today. He will give us strength every day. He says his mercies are renewed every morning. And that helps us to continue to our walk in faith, or, or keep taking one step after the other. And we must learn to serve and to walk in the light. We need to walk in the light as he is in the light. 
All right, now I got to get this out of my system because the whole time studying this, it, it, it keeps going through my mind. That, you know, you know that, that animated uh, Christmas special, Santa Claus is coming to town, and he, and he converts, I like to think he converts the, the winter warlock, and he goes from bad to good. And he, it, that song, just put one foot in front of the other, and soon you'll be walking out the door. And I, you, I'm studying this, and as, I'm like, oh, I can't get that out of my mind. But it's true. This, we have the step of faith, and then you continue to walk. One step, another step. You just continue to go forward. Now, he's going to be talking about the conduct of the believer in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and how we, we, we live out this walk, which that word walk is going to be used several times. I didn't count how many times it's going to be used there, but several times. So we can break this down into a walk in holiness and a, and a walk in harmony and a walk in honesty. And then that would cover those 12 verses. But I don't know that we'll get through all those 12 verses tonight because we want to look at just a number of other va uh, verses. So Paul describes a threefold walk uh, of the Christian uh, to follow. And uh, as we look at, first of all, the walk of, and holiness, which this is like unheard of today. We have more messages preached on, on how close you can come to sin without sinning and how it's okay to sin because God understands. We have very little messages about holiness, which God is really expecting of us. So the Christian messages of holy living. Now, let me pay attention to what I'm going to tell you right here because this is very important. The Christian message of holy living was new to that culture, all right? When Paul started the church at Thessalonica, and then he writes to the Thessalonians, they had no clue of what it was to walk with the Lord, to walk in holiness, to walk in godliness. They were pagans. They were in a Greek culture in which it was overrun and rampant with immorality. They had no clue what holiness looked like. It was totally foreign to them. This is kind of like the society that we're beginning to see now. The problem is, though, we had the example and we forsook it. Our culture said we don't want that. That's old-fashioned. That's uh, Victorian. That's, that's not us. And they try to make anything of holiness just uh, bad, irreprehensible, not good. Amen? And so we are back to almost where Paul was in his day, but you've got to remember, they've never seen holiness. They didn't know what it was and what it was like. And it was not easy for the young believers to fight the temptations around them. So Paul gives them four reasons they should live a holy life. And so under uh, the walk in holiness, we're going to look at four reasons that we should live a holy life. All right? And so... And it's not any easier today because of what? Because of the media. Because of all the outlets, cell phones, televisions, radios, all of that is leading people in the wrong direction. Now, why those instruments can be used for good, more often than not, they're used for, for evil. And they, they capture the heart and the mind. I was, I was reading a booklet last night on, uh, on I, Harry Ironstein. Uh, he wrote about his deliverance from the holiness movement. Fascinating uh, book. I want to order. It's only about $1.66 for each booklet. I want to order about 10 and put them back there so that people can see that. I read that booklet, plus I read uh, another one. Lighthouse Trails is a great ministry to get sound doctrinal information. One on Calvinism I read last night, which was really good. But Henry Ironside, uh, when he struggled with the, the sinless perfection is what was taught in the holiness movement, and he was part of the Salvation Army, and he lived in the, in the late 1800s. He dies in 1951. So he lived at a time where there wasn't the distractions that there was today, and people would think more about holy living. Today, people come to church to hear a message, boom, they're out the door. Amen? And then they don't, you know, the, the Satan steals the seed, like I said, the Sunday night message. Satan steals the seed, right? And this is what happens. 
All these distractions are those birds, those demonic elements of Satan to pluck the message out of your heart. Back in his day, man, it would germinate and it would bother them. They, they were disturbed of, of not measuring up or not having that walk the way that it needed to be. Now, his misunderstanding was that he thought that he could perfect holiness in his flesh, but you can't. The only way you can perfect holiness in your life is to keep your focus on Jesus, not on yourself. And this is what I've had to deal and counsel with people with that are having problems with their walk is because their eyes are on themselves and not on the Lord. And it's something I've got to be careful with. I can get my eyes on myself and not the Lord. But that is the only way. So, so what are the four reasons that Paul gives why we should why we should walk in holiness. Well, one, to please God, verse number one. He says, furthermore then, we beseech you. And beseech is a strong word. We, we beg you. We're, we're uh, you know, beseeching you. We beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. All right, so now notice what Paul is saying here. He says, furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, they're words of exhortation. These aren't coming from Paul. These are coming from the Lord directly. And we've got to remember, we've got to get to this place in our life where when we look at the Bible, we're looking at God speaking to us directly. There's too much academics when it comes to the Word of God. We study it like a textbook instead of like the Holy Scriptures, and God is speaking to me. It was another one of the things in Harry Ironside's little biography there, is that when he read the Bible, he always felt God was talking to him. And I said, that's how it should be for us. You know, God is talking, not just looking and thinking, well, that, that applies to them, or that applies to that person. No, God's talking to me, amen? And so he's saying... Uh, Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk. There's, there's that word walk. This is your, your manner of living, your conduct of living, each and every step that you take. And to please God, so ye would abound more and more. So why should we walk in, a holy, in holiness? Why should that be part of our life? Because we want to please God. And uh, Paul Settle said this to me all the time. He said, Pastor, I just want to please God. I just want to please God. Man, that used to just touch my heart. I just want to please God. And we're either, that's what we're going to do. We're either going to please ourselves or we're going to please God. We're going to please other people or we're going to please God. We need, to, we need to please God. Amen. And that you would abound more and more. So you continue to grow in this area of a desire to please God. Now, I want to take a look at several verses here where it talks about pleasing God. So look at 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse number 4. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse number 4. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which trieth the heart. So he was preaching to please God, not men. This is what has been flipped on its head today. Everything is about pleasing men. I remember before I came here, right, and uh, the church in Ocean County was looking for a pastor. And ultimately, Mike Weigel would become the pastor, best choice they could ever make. And then I would end up coming here about six months later. But there was a fellow that was candidating, and I'm glad they didn't call him back. He was candidate, and they asked him about how was he going to reach the community. And I've never forgotten that till this day. His answer was that he would go door to door taking a survey to see what the people wanted to hear. <laughs> what in the world? You know, we're not supposed to take a survey to see what they want to hear. We're supposed to tell them what God wants them to hear, amen? Which isn't always pleasant or comfortable, especially if you're the guy delivering the message because somebody's going to misunderstand something or take something too far from, of what you said, or you might misspeak and take it farther than you meant it to go. And then they storm out and they're upset, and instead of talking to you about it, they just stew and boo-hoo like a baby and then don't come back. 
And that's sad that it's that way, but it is. I've seen that happen over and over again. Uh, but hey, uh, you know, you've got to, we've got to speak to please God. And we've got to do that not just from the pulpit on the pastor level, but in the pew as we are dealing with people. We've got to tell them that they have to be born again. We've got to tell our relatives that they need to be born again. If our relatives are caught in a religious system that cannot save, then we are doing a great injustice by not telling them the truth. Amen. We don't love them. We say, oh, I love my family, and I don't want to offend them. You don't love them, because if you love them, you would tell them the truth so they would get in the true church, amen? amen? They would hear the true gospel. They would believe and be saved. And so we need to please God in our speech. Even so, we speak not as pleasing men, but God which trieth the hearts. Look at uh, Galatians 1.10. Galatians 1.10. And notice what the Word of God says there. Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 10. There the Word of God tells us, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. See, if you seek to please men, then you can't be the servant of Christ. That's why it's important to please God. The walk of holiness pleases God. Look at Philippians 2.13. It's amazing that all these epistles of Paul, he repeats himself as to what these individual churches, these Christians at these churches need to be doing. Amen? All right, there, uh, Philippians 2.13, there the Word of God tells us what? For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of what? His good pleasure. So God is working in you and doing through you His good pleasure. And we don't often realize or understand that. But we need to trust that the Lord is, is working out His will in our life. Amen. And He is working for His good pleasure. Um, uh, Hebrews 11, 5, a couple of examples, one being Enoch, the other one we're going to look at is Jesus' example. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 5. All right, come on now. Hebrews 11, verse number 5. There the Word of God tells us what? Hebrews 11, 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony. And what was his testimony? That he pleased God. Amen. There's the example of Enoch before he was taken away, before he was raptured. That's what happened to him. He's a picture, an Old Testament picture and type of the rapture. He was translated. Someday we're going to be translated that we should not see death. Amen. And until that time, we need to live a life that pleases God. All right? All right, then look at the example of Jesus, John 8, 29. John 8, 29, the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice what the Word of God says there, John 8, 29. There the Word of God tells us what? And he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that what? That please Him. Amen? I do always those things that please Him. This is Jesus, God the Son, talking to God the Father. He does always those things that please God the Father. This is His testimony as He's talking to those, those people there. And we're going to look at that passage a little bit closer on Sunday evening. All right, um, so it is possible to obey God and not to please Him. That sounds a little tricky, but it's not. It's possible to obey God. In other words, it's possible to be at church, but it doesn't please God because you're here because you're supposed to be here. You have to be here. Or you do right around town uh, because you have to, you know, not because that's what you want to do, you know. Uh, Somebody gives you back too much change. And you go, well, I need to go back. I need to give them this money. I need to give it back. Uh, your flesh wants to say, hey, tough luck. That's their loss. 
Now, I got to tell you, from working retail, run to conveyor plant, if they count every dime, nickel, and penny, and they find out when it's short and what register it's short out of, and they go back and check cameras to make sure no cashiers are pocketing the money, you know, mistakes can be made, but I want to tell you, these people really uh, go the extra mile. And, you know, since we're talking about football, Walmart has the majority ownership of the Denver Broncos. So me and Rob were wondering if they were going to get a 10% discount when they go to Walmart. <laughs> it's really the Walton family, not Walmart, but, I mean, come on now. But, uh, but anyway, you know, they got to fill out these reports and write all this stuff down. They count it all. And so you kind of help somebody from getting in trouble when you return that, that when they give you back too much uh, change. And, uh, and, you know, accidents happen. But anyway, so it's possible to obey God and not please him. Here's a biblical example. We won't turn there, but Jonah, right? Jonah obeyed God after he ran away from God. Then he goes into the, Mediterranean, then the whale comes and swallows him up. He spends three days there, three nights. Then he spits him out. Jonah repents. He spits him out. He goes to Nineveh. He does exactly what God tells him. God blesses his word, but he doesn't bless his servants. Amen? They blessed his word, but not his servants. Because Jonah preached, and there was a revival. And instead of him rejoicing about the revival, he goes out and says, oh, God, take my life, you know? I knew this was going to happen, you know. We want to see a revival. This guy's upset because there is a revival. And then God has to deal with him some more. And he has this gourd, and then the, the sun scorches him. Then the gourd comes up and protects him. Then the gourd is blown, blown away. And God tells him, listen, you have more concern about these stupid little things than you do about these people. And I forget the number. It's quite a large number of people that can't discern between their right and left hand. Those were young children is what he was talking about. And, and, and animals, too. And so it, it was uh, sad. So God could bless his word, but not his servant, because though his servant obeyed, his servant wasn't pleasing God. So it's possible to obey and not please God. So what do we want to do? We want to worship God from the heart. Remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees. He says, you know, with your lips... You draw near to me, but your heart is far from me. And this is, what I, this is the fear that I have. Now, I don't know everybody's heart here, and, and I'm not judging anybody. I'm not sitting up there saying, oh, look at that one and that one and this one. But just knowing human nature and even knowing my own self, there's times you just go through hymns just to get through them, amen? And yet hymns are to be a worship part of the service, amen? When we're worshiping the Lord. The prelude should be a part of... Uh, of preparing our hearts for worship. Amen. And, uh, and then hearing from God. And then another crucial part, and we fail miserably on this, is that after a service, there should be a time of fellowship, not racing toward the door to be the first person out of the parking lot. Amen. Because all that is important in our Christian walk and growth. I mean, I mean how am I going to understand what you're going through if you're not talking to me, and I'm not talking to you. I'm talking that not just on a pastor congregation basis. I'm talking this uh, as a people-to-people basis. And, uh, and uh, it seems like I'm always promoting RU, and it's because they got the right things going on in RU uh, with the men's and the ladies' group and the time of taking or sharing with one another and getting to know one another. And then the fourth talk is just that general fellowship in the back there. And so all that does what? It fosters growth. It fosters a freshness of your spirit. It gives you hope, right? Because the Christian life can do what? Life in general does what? It beats you down. Life in general will drive you to your knees, and Satan is looking to steal, kill, and destroy anybody. We often hear preachers say, oh, he's after the Christian. He's already got the lost person. Forget that garbage. That's bad preaching. You know why? Because he wants to destroy everybody. Amen? And so he's going to drive everybody, even your lost neighbors, to their knees to destroy them, to discourage them. And in the house of God, if we don't have that support system of fellowshiping with one another, then we really, end up, we really end up falling short. And so we want to please God. We want to uh, 
uh, serve him and, and, and please God. And then verses 2 and 3 talk about to obey God. So the first reason, uh, the four reasons that Paul gives of why we should live a holy life, one, to please God, two, to obey God. Verses 2 through 3, back at 1 Thessalonians 4. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. So understand, Paul is saying you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. So once again, the commandments that Paul gives in the epistles aren't Paul's, they're God's. They're Jesus Christ to us. And once again, we've got to remember this, because when we preach, I've been guilty of this, we say, well, Paul said, no, Paul is talking, the Holy Spirit is talking through Paul. Jesus is talking through Paul. Amen? The commandments I gave you, all right, for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, all right? This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Now, I have, you know, people come to me, and, and I, I'm, I'm not bemoaning this. This it should happen. But people are like, you know, well, you know, what's God's will for me? And most of the time, it's something about something specific, and it's hard to tell because I'm not you, amen? So I'm not really sure how God's working in your life. But we'll understand our spe the specific will of God when we start obeying where the Word of God says, this is the will of God. In other words, there's, there's several passages where the Bible says, this is the will of God. This is the will of God uh, concerning you. And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, Right? So right there, we know the will of God is to give thanks in everything. Here, the will of God uh, is to abstain from fornication. So as the several passages, and I'm, I'm just giving you two, there's about five or so more, where it specific, specifically says this is the will of God. If we would practice obedience to those will of God statements, then when it comes to those specific little things about my life, it'll be clear. I'll understand it. I'm not saying you won't have to struggle and wait in prayer, but it will become more clear and it'll be more easier for you to figure out the will of God in the smaller things when you're doing what the revealed will of God says to do. All right? For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Sanctification is a big word that simply means set apart for his purpose. Amen? And in a, in a one sense, uh, we are going through a process of sanctification. We should be each day of our Christian life when we grow more and more in holiness. And this happens as we walk with the Lord and our focus is on God, not on myself, but on God. He begins to work these things out and I begin to grow in sanctification. Now, here specifically, he's talking about sanctification as it relates to sexual immorality. He says, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. All right? That's uh, uh, sex out of marriage. It's sex from people that aren't married. It's anything sexual that God says not to do. Amen? If we do that, we're to abstain from it. Um, some husbands think, well, you know, I can watch pornography. It's no big deal. I'm not committing adultery. Yes, you are. Because Jesus says if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed, uh, with lust, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. Amen? So this is a big thing. You can't be involved in, in pornography and please God and be an obeying God. And you're going to short circuit your sanctification process. And then there will become a point eventually where if you have the guts to come see me, you're probably going to tell me, Pastor, I'm not sure if I ever got saved. And this has nothing to do with your salvation. It has to do with short-circuiting your walk. Amen? And so here he's telling them, he says, you know, walk in holiness. Why? Because we want to obey God. Here he says, abstain from fornication. This is big in our society. This has been big ever since I was a teenager. I'm telling you, high school kids having sex and high school girls getting pregnant in the 70s. And that was my time in high school. There's no doubt this was going on in the 60s when I was just, uh, uh, what would you call that, adolescent? You know, zero to, to 10 in the 60s, right? They, what's the matter, Tony? 
you were a little bit older than me when you in the 60s, right? Well, that was, see, so it was the Free Love Society, so even before me. So this has been going on, you know, and you could probably argue back in the 50s. Yeah, nothing new. And he's saying, listen, you need to abstain from this. You need to stop doing this. And this is part of obeying God, your sanctification. What's another reason why we want to walk in holiness? We want to glorify God. He says in verse number four that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Now, he says every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. Your vessel is your body. He's telling them to learn how to possess, uh, po possess your body, his body, having self-control and sanctification and honor. Amen? And that, that's a lost message. There is no self-control. It's like being an animal. Just do whatever you want to do. Just let it, you know, just do what you want. His vessel and sanctification and honor. Now, how do I know that the vessel is talking about the body. Because there's some people that look at this verse, they say the vessel is talking about your wife because it says about the wife being a weaker vessel. This does not have to do with your wife. This has to do with everybody, married or single, male or female. Now let me show you a couple of verses where it's proof to us that our vessel is our body, all right? So let's look at, uh, at, at 2 Corinthians 4, 7, all right, 2 Corinthians going the wrong way. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. Notice what the Word of God says there. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Now he's talking about the Holy Spirit being in us. All right? So we have, uh, but we have this treasure the treasure is the Holy Spirit in earthen vessels. Your body is an earthen vessel. It's clay. It's dust. It's clay, and it'll go back to dust. Amen? And we're in that process of decay now, even as I speak, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit working through us, not us doing it ourselves. You look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and notice there what the Word of God says. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and vessels and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself of these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. So he gives the example of, the, of a great house that has vessels of gold and silver. Those are ve vessels you would serve water at or for drinking purposes. Those are the vessels you would use uh, for perhaps even some food. And then he talks about and also of wood and of, and, and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. So you got these different types of vessels, some made of wood, silver, gold, and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. What's the dishonor one? You ever watch uh, gun smoke? They don't have bathrooms, right? You have a, a water pan, and he pours some water in there, and he's, he's cleaning himself up. That would be a, a vessel on the dishonor. Uh, you don't have a place to go use the bathroom so you have something in the house, especially in the dead of winter. You don't have an indoor plumbing. You think about this. It's, this is a rare part of human history that we have indoor plumbing. Think about the thousands and thousands of years where they had to go out somewhere to go use, relieve themselves. And so in your house, you would have a vessel of dishonor where you would relieve yourself and then clean that up in the morning. Amen? So you're not walking out in the snow or whatever. But, uh, but anyway, uh, we want to be a vessel of honor. So, and really, verse 21, you have to kind of go back to the deeper context of chapter 2. But you get the gist of what I'm saying. If a man therefore purge himself of these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. The vessel being your body. Amen? 
your body unto honor and sanctification, fit for the master's use and prepared for every good work. So the vessel there is your body. And so he's talking about uh, self-control. If we can glorify God in our own body, all right, then we can glorify God in the body of his church. Think about this. The, 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 each local church is a body of Christ. If each individual is glorifying God with his body and you come together, think about that. The whole church glorifying God with our, the body, the church, amen, because each of the individual parts of that body are glorifying God with their body. See, that's why your walk is important to the whole, right? Your walk is important to the whole. So we say, well, what I do doesn't matter a lot of good people at that church. No, we're one body, and you're part of it. So if you glorify God with your body and everybody else is, then this one body glorifies God. And Paul talks about it. If one part suffers, we all suffer. Amen? Because we're one body. All right, so let's uh, move on to that. Uh, another reason to glorify God so far, we look to please God, or uh, our reason to walk in holiness, rather, to please God to obey God, to glorify God, and to escape the judgment of God. Notice verses 6 through 8 in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 6 through 8. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. All right, so defraud, you know, we're looking at uh, you're, you're cheating your brother, you're not giving him what he deserves, amen, you're holding back from him, or maybe you're even taking from him. Yeah, your brother's good enough to lend you a rake and, and you don't return it because you think, well, he has three rakes, he's not going to miss it. That ain't the issue. The issue is you borrow the rake, you turn the rake, amen? So, uh, so the fraud has the sense of, of cheating somebody or holding back what they deserve. And every believer deserves love one from another because we've been commanded to do that, amen? But anyway, he's talking about defrauding him not defrauding his brother. Let no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter because that the Lord is the avenger of all such. All right? So if you defraud your brother, guess what? God sees and God is going to avenge him. That means it's not going to go well for you. Right? And so now notice what Paul says here, verse number 6. He says that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner because that the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also have forewarned you and testified. They forewarned them, don't do this. Don't defraud one another. Don't be cheating one another. All right, be honest with one another. Okay, forewarn you and testified. He forewarned them what? That God will... Bring, you bring judgment on yourself, that God is their avenger. So you can't mess with other people and, and get away with it. Verse 7, for God has not called us unto uncleanliness and purity, but unto holiness. This is what God has called us unto, holiness. All right, so this is the whole theme of this point, of these verses 1 through 8. Um, verse number 8, he therefore that despises Despised is not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. All right? So notice verse 8, therefore, he therefore that despises. In other words, they look down on what Paul's teaching here. They say, that's a bunch of baloney. That's garbage. God's avenging me because uh, I wasn't fair with this guy or didn't show him brotherly love. God's going to get me. Yeah, come on, Paul. Paul's saying, listen, if you despise what I'm saying, you're not despising me, you're despising God. And he says, you're not despising men, you're despising God. So Paul is uh, speaking on behalf of all the spokespersons of God. And anybody, anybody that's ever been a preacher or preached, I know, Charlotte, your dad could testify to this. You're up there preaching your heart out as you believe God would have you to do it, and then people get upset, you know? And they despise what you're saying. They say, well, that's not true what you're saying. That, that's not, it's not that way. And I've, I've, I've had, you know, people say that to me. I'm, 
Remember that one lady, no preacher's going to tell me how to live. I said, I'm not telling you how to live. I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. You know, she got mad at me. One woman, not here in church, but at, at Walmart in Founds River, said to me, she said, that I said that homosexuality was wrong, and really, she butted into my conversation, and later to find out, she had a son that was a homosexual, and uh, she was like, no, you're wrong with that. I said, no, I'm not. The, God, the Bible is very plain and clear that homosexuality is wrong. She says, no, it's, it is not. It's injustice to say that. I said, oh, I get it now. And I shouldn't have said it the way I did, but I said, oh, I get it now. God made a big mistake on Sodom and Gomorrah. And then she got really mad and turned her back to me. But maybe that, maybe what I said, maybe it did hit her, you know? Because when it's your family, you don't want to think that it's, that it's that bad. But it is that bad, even if it is or isn't your family, Amen. It hurts. It hurts to, if you have one of your children that go off and to that type of a lifestyle. But still, wrong is wrong. Amen? The Bible is the Bible. God's word is his word. He says it's wrong. Then we have got to stand on what he says, despite how people feel. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to be negative toward people. And this is sometimes where we push the envelope too far. We still need to try to reach people with Christ. And if we're belligerent toward them and calling them names and stuff, that's not going to help our cause in winning them to Christ. And really, uh, the sin is sin. Amen? And there's a lot of things that God calls an abomination, not just homosexuality. He also calls fornication an abomination, sex uh, between people that aren't married. Adultery is an abomination. But we don't take the same attitude toward that as we do toward homosexuality. In fact, we kind of, you know, let that go. But we shouldn't because it's all wrong, right? And there's all sorts of things. Uh, and really, what a person needs to do is come to know Christ as their Savior, and then he can change their lifestyle. If we're expecting them to change their lifestyle before they get saved, then that's like a work salvation, and that's never going to happen because they are incapable of changing their lifestyle. They are bound by a lie and a desire. The Bible says that every sin that a man does is without his body, but uh, uh, fornication, it, he sins against his own body. And so there's something that happens there. There's soul ties that are formed. And I always want wanting to preach on this, and I never had. Uh, soul ties. And the Bible talks about soul ties. Uh, soul ties, some are good. Uh, Jonathan... And, so, and, and David, it says that their soul was knit together. That's a good soul tie based on their genuine faith in the Lord uh, God Almighty and their walk with him and their warrior spirit. They both were warriors. So they had that bond of brothers. And then also uh, there's the negative soul tie that happens when two people come together that are not husband and wife. And it creates a negative all time. And sometimes you'll see somebody that's with somebody and say, why do they put up with that? Why? You know, they're like beating them around, they're drunk and belligerent, and, and yet the person keeps being drawn back. It's because of a soul tie that has been formed. And it's, God can break that. But these people that are lost need to come to know Christ as their Savior. And the people that are saved, they need to look to God and take a step of faith to do what is right trusting that God is going to bring the deliverance. Amen? So there's a lot that could be said about that, but that's not tonight's message. All right, so verse 8, He therefore that despises, despises not man, but God who has also given unto us the Holy Spirit. And Paul is talking about himself. God's given us the Holy Spirit. We're speaking to you through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're reading by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit that lives within us should be interpreting these words to our heart, amen, so that we can learn and grow thereby. All right, so I figured we'd only get to this walk in holiness. So Paul devoted a great deal of space to sexual purity because it was a critical problem in the church of that day. It is also a critical problem today. Uh, in Christian churches today, all across our land, marriage vows are not considered sacred. They take a vow, it don't mean nothing. It's not considered sacred. 
That's why within the church, the divorce rate is up to 50%, because a vow means nothing. Amen? All right? Divorce is no longer co governed by the Word of God. In other words, whatever happens, I'm gonna, they're just going to get a divorce over. No, you can't do that. Well, I found somebody that, you know, I love this other person more, so I'm going to get a divorce. No, you can't do that. Amen? Or I just don't, don't like the way things are going. We're, we're no longer compatible. No, you can't do that. Amen? You can't. We don't let the Bible govern what divorce, what it says about divorce, and what it says about remarriage. Because if you get divorced and then remarried, uh, you're in trouble. You're committing adultery. Amen? You cannot, you cannot be divorced unscripturally and get remarried. And I stand firm on that. I will not. I mean, there's enough yahoos out there that will marry anybody. Amen? Amen? And so if you've been married and you want to marry this other person and you've been divorced and the divorce wasn't scriptural, then forget it. I'm not doing it. It's closed. Amen? So now if you're a widow, that's a different story. Widows can remarry. They can do that. Yes? I heard, and, and it, it, I, I heard it from Chris, I don't even want to get it, but it's in there, that if you marry someone that's divorced, it's got to be God. Yeah, if the divorce isn't scriptural, like Jesus said, ex except for the cause of fornication. Um, uh, Matthew 19 goes into great detail of his God's uh, plan for marriage. Then he reiterates about that, but not in great detail, in, in Mark and Luke. And he says it also in Matthew 5, but not in great detail, about uh, being married to someone that's divorced, you commit adultery. You cause her to commit adultery. Now, in the King James Bible, it won't say divorce, it'll say putting away, which is, that's what it means, divorce. But yeah, you're correct, it says that. And you only have that one phrase from Jesus. That's it, that one phrase from Jesus that says, except for the cause of fornication. And uh, so it's, uh, it's amazing, I'm going to tell you. God takes it serious, but most people just ignore it, you know, just, just totally ignore it. All right, now what happens if you did this already, and now you're in our church and you're married to somebody that, didn't have a scriptural divorce, you married, but no, you don't divorce them. You go from that point on, you know, God's going to forgive that. He's not going to hold it over your head, but he'll forgive that, and then you go on. And I kind of hesitate saying that to people uh, that are contemplating divorce because they'll use that as an out. Well, I'll do this, then God will forgive me later. Uh, no, that's not how God wants to operate, Amen. Now, if you find yourself in that position where, all right, you've divorced and now you've remarried and now you, you're living your life, all right, now you need to go on living your life with that spouse. Not, you, does that make sense what I'm saying? You don't live under the guilt that you disobeyed God. God's merciful, he, he forgives you, and you need to go on. Yeah. But Ezra talked about what you said. The Israelites that married pagans during the captivity and they built the, rebuilt the temple and Ezra said, you got to get rid of all your pagan wives. <laughs> so that's in the Bible. Uh, but uh, that's an interesting statement. But under, you know, grace now that we're under now, uh, this is what you're not to do, but yet if this happens after the fact, you realize all right, should have done this, but this is what happened. Now God forgives, and you go on. You know, it's the same, and it's the same way with, with really every sin, right? Whether it's abortion, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol. You know, you don't sit there and say, well, I'm a useless Christian. I can never be used of God ever again. No, you still can, right? Now, when it comes to divorce and remarriage, you cannot be a pastor or a deacon and be divorced and remarried because you can only be the husband of one wife. So, so there is a little bit of a consequence, which tells us that God puts a lot of emphasis on this marriage thing. Amen? This marriage union. He puts a strong emphasis on it. 
And it's a picture of the bride of Christ. And you break that picture when you get a divorce. Because uh, Ephesians 5, he talks about that. He compares a husband and wife relationship to the relationship of Jesus and the church. And so every time you get a divorce, you break the picture. And God doesn't like that. Amen? So there's a lot to be considered. And it's a topic I never really preached a whole lot on, but perhaps I should. But every time you do, there's always going to be a certain segment that's going to get upset because they don't understand the whole picture. Amen? But they don't need to get upset. They just need to understand, okay, you know, this is what I did, this is what it is, now go forward from this point. And, uh, and God is a merciful God. All right, now, some of the other problems within churches, there are gay churches today. And they claim to be Christians. And they are men loving men and women loving women. That's wrong, amen? This is part of the apostasy, too. I mean, you never saw gay churches until this time in history, okay? Um, there are uh, premarital sex and Christian pornography are accepted. That's hard to believe. Christian pornography. And it's like a soft porn type deal. And I'm like, I can't, I can't believe this. I cannot believe this. It's being promoted in the day in which we live. And, uh, and, and premarital sex runs rampant, which, in my opinion, it makes us total hypocrites. If we're going to condemn the homosexual lifestyle and community and yet have premarital marital sex running rampant in our churches, then we're hypocrites. Amen? And we need to get it right. We need to get the whole picture right. And yet, this is what was happening in Paul's day. This is what's happening today. Yet God said what? God said walk in holiness. Amen? And so that is our strive. That's what we want to do. Any other questions or thoughts on any of that? All right, Ken, that was a good question. A good point. I appreciate that. All right. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll have uh, Jeremy uh, take up our prayer request. Dear Heavenly Father, we just humbly come before you. Uh, this evening, and we thank you, Lord, for being our God and our Savior. We thank you, Lord, that you know that our frame is but dust. You know that we carry along not only a divine nature, but a sin nature. The divine nature came when the Holy Spirit regenerated our spirit, but the flesh is still there, and the flesh desires wickedness, and there are times that we yield to that wickedness. I thank you for the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. I thank you that if we're willing to confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Father, we thank you again for being our God and our Savior, Lord. And we pray that in all that we say and do, we will magnify your holy and righteous name. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray, amen. Okay, Jeremy, and there's uh, Jeremy's uh, comment, I'll just share a prayer request. I have, I see the oncologist tomorrow. I pray that that goes well. Uh, my, my blood counts were a little, uh, they were a little low, but he, they're in that area where he says, even though they're low, he'll probably say this tomorrow, 